Hey everyone, it's Trisha McCannon and welcome to part one of um, Return of the Divine Sophia and Mary Magdalene. Uh, this very first part is about the initiation of the Great Mother and I think you're really going to love it. But I'm going to just very briefly take you through just a little outline of where we're going to be going over the next six lessons. In part two, which will be our next section, we're going to go into the hidden history of the Divine Feminine that goes back 230,000 years, if not further back. And of course, most of this history has been wiped away and most of us know nothing about it. So it's a pretty amazing presentation where we really give you the archeology, span the anthropology, the history, and how the Divine Mother, the God the Mother, got split into a million pieces and how she became suppressed so that most people don't know anything about her today and how we fell out of balance. So that's what part two is about. Part three is really one of my favorite subjects, which is the lost symbols of the goddess. As many of you know, I'm a teacher of the mysteries and a student of the mysteries. And the mysteries taught with these amazing hermetic symbols. And these symbols actually act as keys and codes to awaken your consciousness. And so this whole presentation is about identifying those hidden symbols so that when you look at paintings, you look at artwork throughout the centuries, you know um, when you see these symbols that the artists that painted them were actually initiates. They actually were encoding information within the paintings. And even today we have many great artists, painters uh, out there who actually are bringing these symbols back into the forefront once again. But uh, by knowing these symbols, it gives you codes and keys to be able to open these higher doors of awakening. In part three, four, and five, we're going to get into Mary Magdalene. Part, part, um, four is actually all about Mary Magdalene herself, what we know about her, and then the things that have been hidden from us about her personal history. This is, I really love this presentation because you will walk away understanding that Mary Magdalene was thought of by the people who knew her, by the Gnostics, which were the early Christians, really as the feminine Christ or the divine Sophia in incarnated form, much as Jesus was thought of as the male aspect of the Son of God. She was thought of as the daughter of God. So this is a beautiful presentation for that. In part um, five, gosh, it looks like my numbering system's off. We have um, a whole conversation about the, the mysteries of the Holy Grail. What the heck was that whole Holy Grail that some, you know, 2,000 years later, we don't seem to be able to let go of? Why were these legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and what they were searching for so very, very important? Because, of course, they were encoded with hermetic symbolism that if you have the keys to decode it, you begin to understand what they were actually really searching for. So this is a really beautiful presentation in part five. And then in part six, we actually get into the secret teachings of Mary Magdalene. There were over 250 sayings that Mary Magdalene had that the Gnostics collected. And many of them are just as profound as the things that Jesus had to say. And of course, I share some of this in my book, uh, Return of the Divine Sophia, but in this this amazing presentation we're actually going to get into the path of mastery that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were teaching and how it's actually connected with the way of the chalice so let's begin now with part one <clears throat> let's ask the question first off why is it important to us in modern day times with all the craziness of our civilization for us to reconnect with the divine feminine why is it so important well, in truth, it's because anyone can observe that the universe exists in a balance. We need the masculine, we need the feminine. They're meant to be partners with one another, not adversarial. We have the in-breath, we have the out-breath. It doesn't work for us to always breathe out, does it? It doesn't work for us to always breathe in. There's a yin and a yang in the universe, and the ancients understood that these were in a constant flow and a constant dance, and it was this dance that keeps the universe alive and in balance. And this 
divine marriage, if you will, this sacred marriage is key to what Jesus and Mary Magdalene were actually teaching. It wasn't really just about sex. It was about an inner alchemy of transformation, consciousness, and awareness that opens us up, uh, allowing us to develop and awaken our spiritual gifts and to pull back the veils into the higher worlds. And so what has happened, of course, in our culture is that the masculine and feminine have been out of balance for probably about 2,500 to 3,000 years. And we're at a time now where the divine feminine is reawakening with the Me Too movement and um, I think there's a British equivalent that's something like uh, Time For Us or Time Out or you know, there are movements of women awakening around the world. And, you know, these women are saying it's not all right uh, for us to be silenced. It's not all right for us to be forgotten. It's not all right for us to be used as um, or abused. Uh, instead, we really have to be honored and treated with the same respect that the sacred masculine should be. And so we need to create partnership models. So most of us don't have a background in the sacred feminine. We weren't taught it in school. We sure weren't taught it in Sunday school. We weren't taught it in religions. So how can we learn it? So this is one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about the subject and why I put together this amazing presentation, why I've tried to ground it for you in history and give you the keys and codes to be able to um, bring it into uh, fullness in your own life. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to discover that piece of ourselves that basically we've disowned or we've abused or we've hidden or it's been suppressed or we've disempowered. And of course, the part that's been disempowered is the sacred feminine. And consequently, we've had a masculine dominant culture, a patriarchal culture that Although it has many good things, it also has uh, an imbalance to it. This is one of the reasons we have war and aggression and the raping and pillaging of, of people and animals and nations and the earth herself. And so in order for us to get back into balance, this is a part we have to discover and re-empower. So we can come back into a sacred balance within ourselves and within our societies and within the world. So this is really the, the path that Jesus and Mary were teaching, which was that middle path. And it's one that I think is really important for us to discover and to live by in this life. In truth, it may be the only thing that's going to bring this crazy, war-hungry, <clears throat> you know, uh, politically challenging uh, world back into balance. When we start making decisions, as they say in the Native American culture, that will be positive in their effect for our children, our grandchildren, and for seven generations forward. So we are now, in this next presentation, going to be taking a look at the hidden history of the Sacred Mother. But today, we're going to begin an initiation into the discovery of the mysteries, the great spiritual mysteries, how they were linked with the Divine Feminine. And here we see an image of Isis. And Isis, of course, was the I Am presence of the Divine Mother. Her Egyptian name was actually Aset but we called her we call her Isis and that's how she was known to most of the world and of course it's very challenging today that the patriarchy has declared a war on Isis when Isis isn't even the name of that terrorist group it's called ISIL uh, and that we've had a war on Terra, and of course Terra, T-A-R-A, -A, is the Divine Mother, it's the, the Earth herself and all this is kind of uh, laid in by the patriarchy for uh, in, in our subconscious and it actually affects the way that we think just like when we think heavens up and hell is below us it causes us to disregard the sacredness of the earth that is below our feet so in the ancient world in order to discover these mysteries and these secrets it was called pulling back the veils of Isis 
And um, this is a really a lovely image from Manley P. Hall's book that he wrote in the 1930s. Uh, I, Isis, am all that has been, that is or shall be, no mortal man hath ever me unveiled. And here we're talking about the fact that this is the divine presence, the divine intelligence of the creator herself behind the visible world of nature. So nature was her clothing, that was her raiment, that was her gown. And there are many really important symbols that you see here, the balance scales of justice or truth, the, the sound, uh, the cistern, this is a, an instrument of music that is the awakening of the universe. Um, here we have the, the grapes of plenty. This is also connected with Osiris, her husband, and later with the lineage of Jesus and the Merovingian kings. You know, the crown with the fleur-de-lis, the three petals on the top of her head. We'll see a fleur-de-lis shortly, and you'll be able to see the solar nimbus that actually is the serpent biting its tail that is called the aurora boreas which has to do with the cycles of time the beginning and the ending of cycles how we end one age like we're coming to an end of an age now and then we begin a new cycle a new age the destruction of one world is the birth or the beginning of a new one now we see it feet, the fruit which I have brought forth is the sun. So we're talking about creation itself. So this marks Isis as a solar goddess. And she's one of the few goddesses that is both solar and lunar. Normally, as we're going to see, the goddess was thought of as lunar or receptive, and the masculine was thought of as solar. But she is one of the few that has both lunar and solar aspects. And I'll be introducing you to at least one or two others in this presentation today. Now we see these serpents at her feet. <clears throat> and these serpents, of course, are linked to the kundalini energy that rises up the spine that's connected to the end and the pingala or the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems that all really has to do with the, the process of enlightenment. You know, the, those, those are like entwined serpents going up the central nervous system. So we have a triune nervous system. Most people don't really know that. But the ancients did. And they taught things in this balance. So you, we see here with these columns, these columns are very important. You have a column to the left, column to the right, the left-hand path, the right-hand path. But the path of mastery is in the middle. It's the middle path. It's the middle way. This was taught all throughout Egypt and the mystery schools. And here we have, of course, Isis veiling herself, and nature is the veil. So by studying nature with respect, we actually begin to penetrate her secrets. We begin to see how the, the, the swirl of the um, atoms is the same as the swirl of the galaxies. We begin to understand how the veins in the, in the leaf are the same as the veins in our hands. We begin to see the correspondences. And in fact, you know, this, this is, gets into a deeper level of teaching hermetics and um, perhaps you know, I teach this within the mystery school, the Phoenix Farm Mystery School. Perhaps with Sacred You, I'll wind up doing a, an Egyptian course sometime in the next year that you'll be able to take where you'll learn even more about hermetics, but you're going to learn a great deal in this course. So I love this. This is a, actually a statue. Is this incredible of Isis? I mean, how these artists actually did it is just unbelievable. So to you know, the veils of Isis are the covering over the divine. And so it's hard for us to see God, isn't it? Uh, God is, you know, infinite everywhere, visible and invisible. Same for the goddess. In her highest form, she is God. She is the female aspect of God. And so most of us can only glimpse her face behind the veil. And a beautiful face it is as well. Now, in Egypt, there are a lot of hermetic glyphs that are very interesting to contemplate. This is Isis, and you can always tell because she has one of two crowns on the three steps of initiation that look like a throne, or sometimes you'll see her with the crown of Hathor, and we'll be taking a look at that during the course of this workshop. And this is Nephthys. Nephthys was her sister, and her 
crown kind of looks like a it's a symbol for the watchtower basically and of course Magdalene means watchtower as we're going to discover once we get into learning more about Mary Magdalene who was actually initiated as a full priestess of Isis now these girls represent the lunar and the solar aspects of the divine feminine just as there are lunar and solar masculines and you could say men are solar women are lunar that's an easy way to look at it but basically they're talking once again about the fact that there are these two paths there's a um, a left hemisphere of the brain and a right hemisphere of the brain and the path of mastery is a path between them now this pillar it's called the tet or the dejet and it was always associated with the tree of life was also associated with Osiris, the Lord of Light, the Christ of his day, the male Christ. And of course, here's the symbol of the sun here. We can think of this as a halo or the solar nimbus or the light. And here, of course, we have our two friendly little snakes. Here's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems that must be activated to move up the central column of the central nervous system to awaken that halo. That inner light. <clears throat> so we begin by understanding that both Isis and Osiris, the male and the female Christ, were both placed in this central position. In other words, it's not just the man, it's not just God the Father, it's not just God the Mother, it is God the Mother and God the Father. And I, I really really love this this is Isis and again we see the solar nimbus on her head we see these veils now later when we get into looking at Mary we'll see that Mary has inherited these same veils including even the color of her dress which was Isis blue and many times you'll see Isis carrying some kind of a looks like a plant or something but it's got three branches to it and we'll again see this get translated to Mary as uh, a lily or a three-pronged lily or the floor de lis now this is the Freemason expression of how this symbolism and hermetics has been passed down through the ages here are two columns we know what those mean here are two winged angels that's certainly Isis and Nephthys and of course this is this is the path of mastery it's like we must make friends really with our other part it would be nice if they had made both one a male and one a female but that's really where we're going this even the um, square and the compass which are classic Masonic symbols represent being on the square or being truthful you know are you square with me mm -hmm. are you telling me the truth that's what the square means and the compass is describing the circumference of the universe or the the world now in order to basically make this journey and these these sephiroths these actually represent sephiroths on the tree of life and the tree of life is again a um, a very deep subject that was a hermetic symbol for this path of mastery so um, in order to take this path we have must master our fivefold nature air earth fire and water or the physical mental emotional spiritual with the etheric uh, the soul the spirit part of us and then of course we must open our third eye this is the symbol for the third eye uh, in order to reach the inner adium or the inner temple this is the temple that lies within ourself the deep self and of course initiates were taught to build through imagination first and eventually through actual experience and soul travel this connection with the inner planes with the inner temple and to awaken the third eye to make a connection with God from darkness into light and we see the symbols of the Sun the moon and the shining star here all these are very powerful hermetic symbols uh, that give us keys to mastery if we know how to interpret them so it's the union really of these two expressions that that leads us to oneness that leads us to uh, discovering our clairvoyance our clear audience our clear sentience our ability to heal others our spiritual gifts and we see here of course the caduceus beautifully presented the symbol for healing Healing. and we see here again the the threefold goddess with this caduceus of energies going up 
and the white dove, another great symbol of the Holy Spirit or the Divine Mother. So all of this symbology is talking about moving from the mundane world into the inner realms, getting access, not just in your dream state, but actually conscious access into being able to work in these inner levels. And this, of course, was the, the, um, the aim of every spiritual initiate. And you see, again, this initiate uh, in the middle of the two columns, she's got the balance scales of Isis, and she's got the caduceus staff. So we're really talking about leaving the mundane insanity of the world behind and really pulling back the veil to enter the world of truth, the world of spirit, the world of the mysteries. And again, this very beautiful symbolism, we have the two columns, Isis's feet are literally on the Ark of the Covenant. We understand now what the five star of the pentagon or pentagram means. We understand what the caduceus and Isis and Nephthys down here and the two eyes that awaken the third eye in the middle. And we see, of course, that she's veiled. But what's also interesting to notice is she's, she's wearing a crown that's made of horns like it's literally like a crescent moon and as we're going to discover the moon was actually one of the most powerful of all the symbols for the divine mother now this is a beautiful tarot card but we want to again analyze the symbolism in the tree of life the moon is the next sphere up from the physical earth the physical earth was called malkuth um that's a they call it the kingdom but it's basically down here where we are where we're trying to figure out where what to do <laughs> but in order to get onto the tree you have to go into yasad and yasad is the lunar sphere it's the sphere of the feelings of, of emotions because without emotions we can't learn compassion can we compassion is essential uh, for spiritual awakening. That's the, the message really of the goddess and it's the message of, of the Christ. Um, so this sphere also represents the astral plane. In other words, being able to gain access into the inner realms. Here we have Anubis in the Egyptian teaching. He was like kind of the guardian of the door or the keeper of the ways. And when the soul, a person died, he, he escorted the soul like a companion, like a faithful dog, uh, all the way into the halls of Amente or the halls of heaven. And we see on this, it looks almost like a coffin, doesn't it? Very interesting on the waters of life. But what's inscribed here is Kepra. Kepra was the scare beetle and it represents the creator, God the God the Creator. Um, why would they choose a, a dung beetle to um, be a hermetic symbol for the creator? Well, because <laughs> dung beetles lay their eggs in dung. And so they're the only creature that we know that can sort of bring life from, you know, manure, so to speak. So who can do that but God? God's the only one that can bring life from, you know, the refuse of nature. And so this, of course, is talking about going into the inner realms and uh, accessing that. Now, we also see the same symbolism in the solar card. This is the card for the sun. And what do we have here? We have the male and the female. And the path of union lies in the middle between the two. So it's this balance of male and female that we're seeking in our own lives. When we're too yin, we're not motivated enough, too female. When we're too male, we're too aggressive. We're, we're you know, running around, we're so busy, we don't take time to check in with our inner selves and connect with our higher spiritual self. And so again, these are all hermetic symbols by old artists, new artists, and artists in between that are talking about this portal of discovery, a portal of awakening that allows us to awaken our inner sight, 
and our inner hearing, our inner gifts, our inner knowing, and to gain access to the true essence of who we really are. In fact, when we look at Greece, the temples of Greece that actually were derived from the temples of Egypt, over the lintel of the oracle of Delphi, the very first commandment was to know thyself. That's the very first rule of enlightenment. Now, when we begin to study the goddess, this really helps us a lot because what we have had for the last basically, you know, 1500 to 2000 years is we've had only about three archetypes of the Divine Mother. We had, you know, um, Mary the Mother, who was the Virgin and obedient, of course, and, you know, always seemed so beautiful and so sweet. But, you know, hey, she was a virgin. And she, even though she went on to have seven other children, you know, there are some churches that have kept her a virgin forever. Then we had poor little Mary Magdalene that got maligned, as we'll discover, by uh, Pope Gregory I in his 33 homily. This was around five, I think around 561 or 91 uh, AD. Um, he, before that, Mary Magdalene was certainly not considered a fallen woman, but he said, you know, to the other cardinals and bishops, you know, where did she get the money basically to anoint our Lord with that expensive unguent, the spikenard, oh, she must have gotten it from forbidden acts of the flesh. And this started the journey of uh, them maligning her for the last, you know, 1500 years. Now in 1979, the church took that back. Sorry, we didn't mean it. She wasn't really a prostitute, but it was a little late, you know. And so we've had the prostitute or the whore and the virgin. And then we had poor Eve, poor little Eve, who wound up, um, you know, being blamed for the suffering of all humanity because she ate the apple, never mind that Adam ate it too. But, you know, those have been our, you know, you can be a disobedient Eve, uh, a virginal ob obedient mother, or you're outcast as a prostitute, a fallen woman. That's about it. And so that's a very limited, um, you know, expression of uh, anybody's consciousness, male or female. So when we begin to study the goddess, one of the great gifts she gives us is to make us aware of these other archetypes. And throughout this entire course, I'm going to be introducing you to one archetype after another after another, which I think you'll really love. And, and so that way, you know, you don't have to whether you think of them as, you know, mythology or you think of them as history or you think of them as multidimensional beings that still live in the fourth or the fifth dimension or whether you think of them as historical extraterrestrials that came to Earth that were world civilizers, it doesn't matter. They are archetypes and we know them through their symbols, their powers, their stories and what they came to uh, represent or embody. And by studying them, we can begin to claim these different parts of ourselves. And let's just look at some of those kinds of parts. I mean, this is just a handful of some of the roles that we can play. All of us have these archetypes that live within us, the healer, the warrior, the mother, the teacher, the athlete, the mystic, the philosopher, the rebel, the student, the romantic, the writer, the artist, the queen, the sage. Now, the more we can get in touch with these parts and and use the, we want the good queen. We don't want the bad queen that's, you know, up high and mighty over everybody. We want a wise queen that's actually going to bring value to other people's lives. So the, the, the same thing with a warrior. We don't need a mad, crazy, destructive warrior we need a wise warrior that chooses very carefully what he or she chooses to, um, you know, stand for, fight for. What kind of rebel do we need? Again, we don't need a self-sabotaging rebel that shoots ourselves in the foot and sabotages our hopes for success. We need a rebel that is wise enough to go, this system isn't working. Somebody has to stand up and say something. Let's do it in an intelligent way so our voices will be heard. So. The goddess gives us uh, um, a glimpse into some of these other aspects and archetypes that live within us. And it's one of many reasons why we study the goddess and, and why it's so important for her 
and uh, to come alive in our time and our age so that we ourselves begin to step into these roles men have been stepping into those roles for centuries they've been able to be merchants and knights and kings and warriors and artisans and women pretty much were not allowed to do that most of the time and so these secrets of how to access these parts of us to and to balance them out were taught within the great spiritual mystery schools within the mystery schools one of the goddess archetypes that represents knowledge the illumination of knowledge itself was Vesta you've heard of the Vestal Virgins the Vestal Virgins actually existed they were in Rome and um, I think there were seven of them um, and basically though they were not allowed to have sex they actually were having to stay real virgins for many centuries the word virgin just really meant an unmarried woman it didn't mean you weren't allowed to ever have sex with somebody that you loved but in this case by the time we get to Rome which was a patriarchal culture the vestal the vestal virgins were actually not allowed to have sex with anybody and but they were they had they were highly respected they had beautiful quarters they had access to books and scrolls they had spiritual abilities from healing to prophecy and oracular work uh, they were present at all state ceremonies and um, uh, but of course if they did choose to sleep with the man it did not go well pretty much that was it the end of their cherished life and so they were highly trained women but they were not allowed to um, be spiritually empowered and also be in a relationship so we can see how the patriarchy was like if we're going to give you power we're only going to give you a certain amount of power you're not you're going to have to pay a price for that power and that price is you won't be able to be mothers you won't be able to have husbands you won't be able to have families you know we'll give you the power but that's as far as you're getting but Vesta is uh, a champion of holding the light and those vestal virgins you can sort of see this is a, a really cool image isn't it where they're actually doing some scrying work um, there are corollaries to her as we're going to find Bridget in the Celtic uh, um, also ha played a lot of that same role of illumination so the feminine the goddess gives us insight into the feminine face of God who lives within the cosmos and this is a, a gorgeous painting of Pravati she's just beautiful and she holds the um, you know the the divine masculine actually in her hands now there are many great symbols to the divine mother and we're really going to spend some time on all of these symbols many many symbols uh, in our next presentation but in this one we really want to talk about the moon because of all the symbols of womanhood the moon has probably been the one most connected with the divine mother and the divine feminine uh, she's ever-changing just as women are and yet she's always the same she has many phases and many many moods she's reflective and she's receptive you know she the only reason we have a full moon is because she's reflecting the light from the Sun and so um, this is an, a, one of the ways that women uh, show up in the world they have supported their men from time immemorial uh, they've supported their children they've supported their communities they've supported their their tribes and yet they have an enormous effect if you took away all the women in the world you know it would be a sad barren place and everything would die within about a generation so the moon regulates earth's tides it has a great effect on the earth it affects mating cycles you know uh, whether someone wants to have sex or not they've actually done scientific tests and discovered it also affects um, violence rates it affects um, uh, people's passion it affects the growth of plants full moons actually pull the minerals up the stalks of the plants and so when you harvest in the full moon you get the maximum potency of the vitamins and minerals from the earth itself the moon of course is connected to women's monthly cycles you know every woman who you know still has you know her uterus in place knows how this goes so gestation ovulation and menstrual cycles it's linked also to psychic abilities it is linked to water you know if you've ever seen the moon on water it just feels like 
these two are a perfect coupling. And water and the moon uh, were always uh, uh, connected with oracular um, uh, visions, uh, whether it's through dreaming, through meditation, or through actually scrying in the water. And the scrying practice actually is something that people used. And it's because the energies in the daylight, when the sun comes up, it activates everything at a very high level. Uh, and, and of course, without the sun, no life at all either. But then in the sunrise and the sunset, these are uh, what are called uh, thought of as between times. They're like a crack between the worlds. Uh, uh, the, it's the change between day and night. The energy of the sun comes up, you know, so high noon is not great for scrying work. Uh, it's great for other things. All the plants are like going, ah, yeah, we're so happy. Okay, but then when the sun goes down and you're in that window, and then in the night where the sun's on the other side, really, of the planet, um, or the, our planet's turned, or the sun is facing that part of it, this is sort of the time of stillness, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of people become very nocturnal. Some people wind up, you know, writing at night, reading at night, painting at night, because the world around them, all that noise has died down, and also the the energy that the solar uh, uh, energy is actually activated in people and plants and things at an energetic level, all that vibrational noise is very still. So it's a time of being able to go in and listen at an inward level. So for centuries, our ancestors actually understood this probably a heck of a lot better than we do today, although we've done the scientific test to prove that this wasn't just crazy superstition. It was actually based on science. Basically, they would plant by the dark of the moon because all the energy was the lowest. It was asleep. It was better for the seeds. You know, it's like they would really get to germinate. And then they would um, later, months later, when the plant had grown to fullness, they would harvest by the full moon because that way they got the greatest nutritional value from their from their food now let's look at these eight cycles of the moon and each one of us were actually born in one of these cycles and I can't even though I'm an astrologer I can't tell you exactly how to figure out when you were born but there are astrologers out there um, who this is one of their specialty and I think there's actually a book you can always Google to see if you can find a book on um, finding out when you were born in the in the moon cycles but people who are born in the dark of the moon as you can imagine this is all about germinating these are kind of like deep deep quiet ones the crescent moon this is kind of when we're stepping out the First quarter moon, this is when we're making lots of plans, and obviously it's about balance, a balance between giving and receiving, between in relationship and so forth. This is where we're reaching out, we're reaching forward to achieve more, achieve more, achieve more. Uh, the full moon is obviously the, the excitation point at the very top of the chart. The disseminating moon, I was born in the disseminating moon, is all about sharing information, sharing information. Certainly it fits me. The last quarter moon is about um, uh, beginning to go inward and figure out what you want to do with the information that has been shared. And then, of course, the balsamic moon is, is really going inward more because it's right before the, the dark of the moon. And you can sort of see these different meanings and phases. I actually have a chart like this in, um, in my book, Return of the Divine Sophia, you know, if, if you actually want to, you know, uh, write all of these down or study them. But this is it's, it's very logical. Think about it. The energy comes up and then the energy comes down. And so all of them are important, and there were certain goddesses that were associated with them. The Gibbous Moon, for example, which is right before the full moon, was all about Vesta, the, the Vestal Virgin that we've talked about. The full moon, as you can imagine, love and celebration, Aphrodite, we all know who she is, the goddess of love. Kuan Yin would be more of a wisdom teacher, the, 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 the disseminating mood. Then we're going into Hecate time, and we're going to be talking about some of these goddesses. So pay attention so you can kind of figure out what suits, what fits for your personality in your life. And the balsamic moon is obviously 
a place of deep, deep wisdom, Persephone. She was a goddess of the underworld who came down to help souls. And here we are with the crescent moon. I love the crescent. It's so beautiful, Artemis. We're going to be talking about her today. And Artemis, Diana, really, they're different names for the same goddess. So, uh, and Corey. Corey is also same name in lots of ways, really, for Persephone. Uh, so there are many goddesses connected to the moon. Don't you just love these images? They're so beautiful, and I'm so appreciative to, to all the people who have uh, this deep love for the moon who have uh, been a part of helping in this presentation. This, um, these are some of the goddesses we're going to be looking at today. Isis, Hathor, Naphthys, Ishtar, Artemis, Diana, uh, Bridget or Brigide, uh, Caridwen, Hecate, Celine, Yamaye, Kota Q, Mary, Mary Magdalene. So I just appreciate all of the, um, the artists whose images and photography, and some of this, of course, is mine as well, has graced this presentation. So the moon was once a symbol of the great goddess Isis, and we can sort of see, you know, many times they wore it on the forehead. And I want to just point out, now you understand, of course, the columns, the J and the B are represent jo Joachim and Boaz. They were the two pillars of initiation. We see the crescent moon at her feet. She's wearing the cross, which was a very ancient symbol long before Christianity, and we see the tree of life above her head. And so now we, we may not understand the depth and breadth of all these symbols, but we can begin to <clears throat> interpret the hermetic symbols and understand what they're talking about. She was, of course, the mother of the world. And I want to point out that although this is Mary, <clears throat> she's dressed in Isis blue, and she has the crown of stars that Isis often wore. And here we have the three sections of the crown. So Mary inherited all these things from Isis. <clears throat> so here we are again with the crescent moon. We have the serpent at her feet, and we'll be talking about that uh, when we uh, get to class number two. We see the crown on her head and the scepter, and she's wearing Isis blue. These are all the symbols of Isis. Once again, Mary with the moon at her feet and the stars around her head. Now, this is the Lady of Guadalupe. I don't know if you all know her, but her story took place about 500 years ago down in Central America. Um, and it was a time, really, when the Spanish had come in and they had basically decimated a lot of the population and killed a lot of people and suppressed them. and um, the people were very poor and they were really struggling. And there was a young um, uh, Mexican um, guy who was walking by an a area where there had once been a temple to one of the Mayan goddesses. <coughs> and he um, had an experience where this lady, this beautiful lady that looked like this with the stars on her blue cloak appeared to him and asked uh, him to go to the town fathers and to have a temple built to her there and and to my lady. Well, he didn't think that the town fathers would listen to him, but he did as she asked, and of course they kind of threw him out. And when he was walking back by the same place very dejectedly, um, she appeared to him again, and he explained, they're not going to listen to me. And she um, um, actually... Uh, said that she would produce a miracle, which were these roses, these beautiful Spanish Castilian roses that only grew in Spain, that only the Spanish would know, very beautiful red long stem roses. And she filled, it was winter time, she filled up his apron with these roses. And of course, it was winter, it was impossible to even have the roses over there. So this time when he went before the council and he uh, let the roses fall out, of course, uh, it, it spoke for itself, but m even more amazing was on his apron was an image of her, and when they analyzed the, eye, the irises and the pupils, they saw his reflection in her eyeballs. And so this is the Lady of Guadalupe, and even today, hundreds of years later, the apron still hangs in uh, Mexico behind glass in one of the great cathedrals that they did build 
build on that spot. And so uh, the lady of Guadalupe, you know, she didn't say, hi, I'm Mary. She said, I am the lady. And this is one of the things we should really understand again and again with the 250 appearances of Mary all over the world in countries that don't have, didn't even you know believe in her. Uh, she'll say, "I'm the Lady of Sorrows. I'm the Lady of Love. I'm the Lady of uh, um, I'm the White Lady. I'm the Lady of um, Forgiveness." Uh, so she identifies herself like that, and of course, whoever whatever the culture is, they'll say, "Oh well, she was Mary, or she was." whatever the goddess is. And this is this is actually, I think, the image that was emblazoned on that apron. Quite incredible. And again, we see that the crescent moon here, and we see the rays, quite extraordinary. Now, all this is actually linked to the mysteries of the Holy Grail. And we're not going to be talking about that until we get into Mary Magdalene in our last three sections. But the Grail is very much connected with the goddess, with the moon, and with these great mysteries. So let's take a look now at some of the best-known ancient goddesses that are associated with the moon. Certainly Ishtar is a goddess that, you know, was huge throughout all of the Mediterranean area, Sumer, Babylon, uh, Nineveh, um, uh, throughout the Levant, the area where the Hebrews were. And we see right above her head, she's both lunar and solar, but we see this moon. And so her symbols were the crescent moon and the star. And so actually, interesting enough, these are the symbols of the, the uh, Muslim faith is taken on today but we see the tree of life coming out from her body she's holding the tree this is the flower of life here <clears throat> and we see the symbol for uh, looks like for Nibiru the planet that she's from here uh, and then we see the symbol for earth here the, it's the points of the that you have to actually count so very interesting and we're going to see pictures of um, in the Levant, she was known as a nymph, and many times she had these animals around her. She was considered the daughter principal in her era, and this would have been thousands of years ago. Now, another goddess that you may or may not have ever heard of that I really love is Epona. Epona and Rhiannon are both Celtic goddesses, and they are also associated with the white horse and the moon, both of them. It could be that they're two names for the same goddess in different cultures, Irish and English, but or it could be that they were two separate goddesses. But there's a great story about, you can see here's the owl, the white owl, the white horse, and the, and the oceans, of course, because, of course, England and Ireland and Scotland, they're island cultures. So Rhiannon has a very great story. I love her story. Um, it's very deep. Um, the story is that there was a prince, and this prince went out hawking with his whole retinue and so forth, and he saw this beautiful lady on a white horse in at the edge of the forest, and he sent two people to go and get her. Well, after quite some time, they came back, and they said, Sire, you know, no matter how hard we rode, we could never catch her. So the next day, they came back. Once again, it repeated, and he said, even more men. They came back. We couldn't catch her. By the third day, he said, I'm going to you know, go after her myself. So he, in fact, did go after her. And as he was chasing her through the forest on her white horse, on his horse, once again, it, you know, he, he could never catch her. <laughs> and so finally, he called out, lady, will you stop? And she stopped her horse, and she said, you only had to ask. And so, I mean, isn't that just like us, you know? <laughs> it's like, if the man would just ask us, we'd be happy to help, you know? We only had to ask. And so they spent the day together in the forest, and they fell madly in love. And she explained that she was from a race called the Tuatha de Danann, who were the people of Danu. They were the, the shiny ones. They were like the elfin people, long, very long-lived. And um, that she had been forced to be betrothed to somebody she didn't love and she was going to have to marry him <coughs> unless someone intervened and so uh of course he was like well i'll i want to marry you she said well i can't just stay you know when you marry me you actually have to win my hand and so she told him that a day in our world was a year in their world and so 
um, I think that's how it goes, or maybe it was the other way around. But anyway, he wound up having to make a plan with her, and sure enough, he appeared a year later, as she told him, dressed kind of as a beggar, but he was a great archer. And he wound up going through the crack between the worlds into the Tuatha de Danon's world. And he came when there was this great, you know, wedding about to happen. And the bridegroom, who was quite a braggart and an egomaniac, I kind of, I think of him like an elfin bubba, you know. But he wound up saying, you know, whoever wins the archery contest, I will grant them a wish. No matter what their wish is, I'll grant it. So, of course, the king had to win the archery match, and his wish was that he would take Rhiannon as a bride. And, of course, the, you know, as you can imagine, the fairy prince was pretty angry. And so that the story is they came back, and they were together, and they they wound up having a child. And their story continues, um, you know, the, the, the child was actually kidnapped and stolen by the fairy prince, and she was blamed for... Um, for having killed kill the child, which of course she didn't. And about seven or eight years later, a farmer came with the child that he had found as an infant in his manger. And of course, they realized this was their child because he looked just like them and everything was restored to her. But her story is about love and perseverance and loyalty and about um, not letting the uh, seven year travail of life uh, or weigh you down because during that seven years, um, you know, when she was um, accused of murdering her own child, she uh, became the white horse and she carried the burdens back and forth for the people like a, a beast of burden to the river. And um, that was the penance uh, because they wanted to kill her and, and the kingdom did. And of course, her love would not allow that to happen. So there are many stories. Rhiannon's a very interesting goddess. But, you know, we look at what they learned and what they represented. And she represents loyalty, love, perseverance, endurance through all obstacles, and then coming out on the other side uh, well. In, in Rome and Greece, there was Demeter and then her daughter, Persephone. And, of course, most of us know Persephone's story. She was the one that was out picking flowers in the springtime, and the earth opened up, and Hades came in his chariot with, you know, 12 black horses and scooped her up and took her down to the underworld. And her mother, of course, didn't know where she'd gone and couldn't find her and became grief stricken. And eventually she discovered, of course, she was in the underworld and she insisted she'd be released. But, um, you know, the story was that because she had eaten six pomegranate seeds, the gods uh, that didn't want to anger Hades declared that she would have to remain in the underworld six months of the year and then she could come back six months of the year. And of course, the mundane ex explanation of this is, you know, this is how our, an our ancestors um, uh, told the story about spring and summer when she returns to the earth and a uh, fall and winter when she goes into the underground and her mother, the earth goddess Demeter, either celebrates, you know, and everything is rich with fecundity or, um, or, uh, is in grief. And that is a, the, the easiest mundane explanation of something that is a great spiritual mystery. Um, but the deeper explanation of Persephone's story uh, was really woven into the Aleutian mysteries of ancient Greece. And in those mysteries, um, Persephone's secret name is Kore, C-O-R-E. You saw that earlier on the moon chart. And Kore is the kernel or the grain of corn that falls from the tree of life, in other words, us, who has to come down into the lower worlds to experience all the travail that life offers us. <clears throat> so half the time, she's in the higher worlds of light with God the Mother, the Goddess, and half the time she's down here in the earthly plane going through all the shadow realms that we all go through with all the challenges, the many challenges that we have down here. So Persephone or Corey is really... A, a symbolic um, representation of you and me, of us, of the journey that we take, 
half the time between lifetimes we're in the higher worlds where we're reconnected with our soul family with the awareness of who we truly are and with the divine uh, um, God goddess all that is and then half the time we're down here in the shadows going what the heck does all this mean so these are very deep mysteries but Persephone becomes consequently an advocate for helping souls that are trapped in the lower worlds because she brings that light with her and um, she becomes a healing presence <clears throat> You can see the moon here. This is Rhea in Roman mythology, also thought of as, um, you know, Juno. Um, Yemaye, this is in the African traditions. She's the goddess of the oceans. Again, that connection with water. Serena or La Luna, again, the moon is called La Luna in some cultures. Kota Q in the Mayan culture. Hathor in Egypt and we see here what looks like the horns of a cow with either the Sun or the moon here and Hathor again has both qualities she's more lunar and then she is solar but later Isis was to take the same headdress now Hathor it was a goddess she was probably in the Sumerian uh, she was probably Ninharsag the mother the chief medical officer who was the mother to humanity but in Egypt she was beloved and thought of it as Hathor now Hathor is the cosmic cow and as we're going to discover in our next module the cow happens to be one of about 20 uh, symbols of the Divine Mother why because from cows you know they said we get the milk and honey of the universe <laughs> So the galaxy, this is why it's called the Milky Way, the mother's milk. So Hathor's temples worked with healing. They work with light and sound, you know, um, what we think of as like Tibetan bowls or crystal bowls. They, they charge the water in the temples with uh, their hands through sending color into the, the energy. So they really became sort of like psychologists therapists sound healers uh, also there's an incredible astronomical uh, clock of the great ages in in the um, in the temple of Dendera which was Hathor's temple now here's also a very beautiful image of that crescent moon and Sun and we have to remember that this is not only Hathor's headdress and Isis got this headdress later <coughs> But this is also one of Ishtar's symbols, but kind of turned to the side. And um, this is all, again, the merger, the marriage between the lunar and the solar, talking about mastery. These are hermetic symbols that indicate mastery. <coughs> now, this is a really beautiful picture by my friend Lisa Iris, an incredible artist with, um, of Isis, the Great Mother. She's done some incredible images of both gods and goddesses. And in this, of course, she's wearing the Hathor headdress. This is, again, you know, who was Isis? Well, there's so much we can say about her. We could spend the whole six program, you know, presentations on Isis alone because she was the original mother. And here's Isis and here's Horus, her son. And, of course, afterwards it becomes this version. And then this is the version most of us know today and see Mary is wearing the Isis blue if you notice so she was a healer she was a mother she was a wife she was a widow when her her um, husband was murdered she was a queen she was a civilization maker she was an herbalist she was a magician the mistress of magic and <clears throat> she was just incredible she was the original queen of heaven Queen of Heaven, Mother of Earth. Now these are some of the symbols that are her symbols that Mary inherited. <coughs> the solar nimbus, we see that, and we saw that Isis had it, the moon at her feet, the crown of stars, the fleur de lis. For those of you who don't know, this is a fleur de lis, and we see little Mary holding the fleur de lis as a lily, as a staff, just as Isis held it literally as a staff of queenship. The white dove connected always with the goddess and the, the Holy Spirit, the mother and child, 
the blue cloak, and we see blue and red. And many times you see this with Mary Magdalene as well. The blue is Isis blue. The red has to do with the ancient expressions of the Divine Mother. The, our ancestors actually <coughs> painted the goddess figurines with ochre red even 200,000 years ago. And we, we have evidence of this as we come forward 20,000, 30,000, 15,000, you know, um, uh, 4,000, 1,600 years ago. We literally have found this. And so you're going to, and I wore red today, by the way. In, or in celebration of her. The classic colors of the goddess are uh, the maiden, the mother, the crone, white, red, and black. But this Isis blue is really important, and we're going to be tracking the red and the blue through this whole presentation. The two columns, of course, and then the four columns. <coughs> we see the Isis blue here, cloaked, veiled Isis. And here we see the stars and the solar nimbus. This is a stained glass window. Here we have Mary Isis, and here is Isis. The two columns, here's a beehive. We're going to be discovering what that means in the Book of Knowledge. All this is going to be in Section 2. The triangle, once again, we see the J and the B of the two columns, the crown, the crown of stars, the pendants. We're going to decode all this, the mirror. All of these things have meaning. So here again we have Isis and Horus, and here's Mary and Jesus. So this was the archetype, and this is Yashoda and Krishna. So I want to just make clear that there have been these other amazing incarnations of avatars that have come into the world. Krishna, as you know, is over in the east, thought to be an incarnation of Vishnu and the creator. And so this is his mother, Yashoda, and this is Vishnu. And here, of course, is that Isis blue. The blue and the red. So blue, red, gold, just absolutely beautiful. Now, one of Isis's names was also Ahu. Most people don't know this. It meant high dove. And we know that the dove has been associated with Mary and with Jesus and the Christ lineage again and again and again. We see Mary standing on the world here with the child in the Isis blue with the, with the gold and the red, and the dove is coming down. And here we see Isis with the crown over her head. This is, believe it or not, Ma not Mary and Jesus. This is the Rosicrucian temple, and this is Isis. <clears throat> Once again, the two columns, the Isis blue, the blue, the red. And these columns all have meaning, not just the two columns, but the four columns and the six columns. They have a deeper hermetic significance that we'll probably be getting into in the next time. This is Diana Artemis. I love her. She's just really wonderful. Maybe because I love trees and I love the forest. I don't know about you guys, but I grew up across from a great forest. And so uh, I love the animals. I love, I love the nature itself. And um, Diana Artemis, a Greek and Roman, different, two different names for the same goddess, uh, lived in the forest with women. Uh, and um, there, she was a goddess of the trees and of the forest and of fresh springs, of, of waters. And she was also a goddess of chastity. In this case, she was a virgin goddess, meaning she chose not to marry. Uh, goddess of the hunt, of the moon, nature, and animals. Uh, in the Greek cosmology or mythology, however you care to look at it, she was the daughter of Zeus and Leto and the twin sister of Apollo. Uh, as soon as Artemis was born, she helped her mother give birth to her brother, thereby becoming the protector of childbirth and labor. So she was very much a defender of women's rights. And I think she's very much out now with the Me Too movement. Um, I think a lot of these women, they're certainly not militant. They are, but they are saying we have got to protect ourselves. Now, she was a protector of animals. So normally when we think of men going hunting with the bow and arrow, they're out there killing the animals. This is the opposite for Diana. <clears throat> was She was actually a protector. And there's a story about her <clears throat> that she and her women were bathing in this beautiful uh, creek, a, like a, a pool, a lake, inside the forest. And there was a peeping tom that was hiding in the bushes uh, watching them. And when she discovered him, she turned him into a stag and she actually hunted him down 
and she shot him. And so although she's a protector of the stag, the symbol of the stag also became a symbol of um, the fact that when men overstep their boundaries with women sexually, which as we all know, this seems to have been going on for uh, probably forever, but definitely for the last uh, 2,000 years in a big way, maybe 3,000. Um, and, and finally, women have enough of a, a voice because finally we can vote. You know, we, we only gained the right to vote in America in 1922. And I think France and England only got the vote after World War II in the late 1940s. And so now we have a voice and um, we can stand up for ourselves. But I love these images of her. And you'll see her with the moon a lot at night, hunting at night. But you can see here that, that Bambi is her friend. Uh, you know, she only hunts them down if they're peeping toms. Now, Diana was really loved, really, really beloved by the people. And her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, there were these statues of Diana. You could see from these other pictures she was a hot babe. But in these statues, she has many different breasts. It's not because she really had all these breasts. This is a hermetic symbol to say, you know, look, I provide the milk and the honey for all of humanity. Come suckle at my breast. You know, I will give you what you need to sustain you. And so whenever you see these things, you know, our culture doesn't think hermetically. We're, le we're starting to use symbols again because of the computer, but they're exoteric symbols that direct us to, you know, save our work or to, you know, uh, go to this website or that website. But the hermetics is an esoteric symbol language that's talking about something much deeper. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a, a student of hermetics and a teacher of it. And so this is actually the ruins, a painting, a part of the ruins of one of Diana's temples. This was actually the temple of Diana. Look at the scale and the majesty of this temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And here again, we see the scale. These are gigantic chariots. Look at how huge this is. Just incredible. Now, this was largely destroyed uh, around uh, 400 AD by the Theodosian decrees. This is when um, uh, uh, Pope uh, Theodosius declared that basically any temple that was not Christian would either be taken over or torn down and destroyed. And it was a great loss to humanity when that happened, uh, in my opinion, because these were absolutely not only energy vortexes, but they were architectural marvels. And today, these are the ruins of what's left, which you can see is just, uh, you know, still magnificent, but paltry next to what once existed. Now, let's take a look at Brigide in the Celtic world, and she's a really important goddess, so we have quite a few really powerful images for her. She's both solar and lunar, and she was thought of it, like Vesta, as a bringer of enlightenment. She was a goddess of poetry and writing, of healing, that means herbs in the ancient world, of dance, and of all of the arts. Really beautiful, isn't she? She was a teacher to the Celts, and she came to not only breathe, bring them the arts of civilization, but she was also a smithy, very practical. So it's not just weapons that we need made out of metal. Think about all the things that are made out of metals from screwdrivers to, you know, um, washing machines, you know, from, um, you know, uh, uh, knives to be able to cut rope. Uh, to uh, earrings. There are so many things made out of metal, and she taught these arts of, of smithing to the Celts. She oversaw all sacred wells and water. Just beautiful. And she also, not only water, which is lunar, feminine, but also solar, goddess of the sacred flame. Her center in Kildare, Ireland, in fact, was kept alive. That flame was continually kept alive for literally thousands of years. And it only was put out, this is Christianity, around 382 AD. So, I mean, that's day and night there were people tending this flame. And the flame represented knowledge. It represented illumination. We will not let the flame of knowledge go out in the world. And, of course, she's similar to Vesta in the Roman world. So, you know, 
are these different goddesses or they got the same person that represents the same principles but they were known by different different names in different parts of the world we don't truly know that but similar very very similar vestal virgins Brigitte was the mistress of water and fire and here you see the two elements coming from her hands therefore she is both lunar and solar like Isis is she's got the the power to work in, in both a extroverted visible way and also to go within and tap into those inner powers she was also the goddess of light and in fact we um, you know her her holiday was February the second and you see here one of the things that happened on that day was you know we are all tired of winter you know winter's just gone on and on and on so everyone showed up with a candle and they did ceremony to say we believe the light is going to return spring is coming and this this energy will quicken the plants and the trees and things will begin to grow again today in our modern world we've turned it into groundhog day can you believe <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty cute little critter, that groundhog, I must say. You know, Pachatani, as, as uh, Bill Murray would say. But it seems like a demotion to me that we went from honoring the divine goddess of light and growing things to the little groundhog. Uh, but this is one of the eight high holy days of the year, and it's called Embolic. And even over in Ireland and England today, instead of St. Patrick's Day, who, by the way, was just kind of suppressive of the Divine Feminine, they have St. Bridget's Day, which is really great, and it's February the 2nd. And here we have people who are bringing this knowledge forth again. There are other writers who are, are doing research and books, and, you know, I take my hat off to all of them, because I think it's important for us to have these other healthy, positive leadership archetypes uh, of for women in the world. Now, the Catholic Church could not get rid of her. No matter what they did, everyone loved her. It was like Isis got turned into Mary, not that Mary wasn't great, okay? But uh, uh, that's what they did with Bridget. They turned her into a nun, Saint Bridget, okay? She looks pretty severe here, okay? <laughs> but fortunately, there are some less severe images of her. And notice, you know, the artist cl clearly knew what they were doing because here she's holding the flame of illumination from her sacred altar as well as a book of knowledge. And of course, that's what Bridget represented, a bringer of knowledge, a bringer of light. And here, of course, she's got more of the Catholic, you know um, symbols but again the artist has got the three tri the triad here of the of the crown of Isis don't they you know so you know you can think of her as the bride she was called Brigid or the bride and some call her Bridget or St. Bridget now Caridwen was the Celtic mother goddess okay and uh, she's got a quite a story you can see the moon behind her she's linked to the owl to the moon uh, and, and through association and, and, to, and the, to the cauldron as well. She's part of what is known as the triple goddess. And the triple goddess is represents really the three stages of a woman's life. The maiden cycle, the mother cycle, and the crone cycle. The maiden is wearing white, the mother's wearing red, and the crone or the sage, the wise woman, is wearing black. And these really kind of like are the core colors really of um, of, of, of our lives. We're in innocence, then you know we're in life producing, she who bleeds but does not die, that's the mother. And then the crone, and of course her symbol is the owl, which has to do with clairvoyance. And we'll be talking a lot more about the owl in our next presentation. <clears throat> These are the triple aspects of her. Bridget as the maiden, Caridwen as the mother, and Hecate, or sometimes known as Kalesh in the in the um, in the as the sage. So she's the wisdom keeper. She holds the secrets of life because she's lived a long enough life to be wise. And death, you know, she doesn't fear death. And, of course, she knows that there'll be rebirth. And I thought this was just a beautiful image here uh, of, of the crone. And there's a whole history, really, with the crone. And 
how the, you know, I mean, when we say man, we say youth, man, sage, don't we? But what happened to sage for women? We could say maid and mother matron. That's another way we could put it, uh, you know, but it's the wise woman. And crone actually meant wise woman. But of course, over time, it's come to give us this picture of this little old woman carrying sticks in the woods that unfortunately, you know, is ugly and has a terrible nose and got burned as a witch. And of course, that's actually because the Catholic Church decided over its many centuries that it, you know, priests were allowed to marry for many centuries. But then they discovered the priests were leaving their homes to their families, naturally, to their children. So they decided they wanted that property. So they made it so priests couldn't marry anymore or have children or have sex. And so that way they inherited all the property and they got richer. Well, of course, what this meant was that, you know, women got turned out of their homes. Uh, uh, furthermore, they would send the men and the sons to battle, and only men were allowed to own property. So guess what? When they got killed in battle, the women got turned out of their homes. Where do they have to go? If a relative didn't take them in, they basically went to the woods, and they lived in a cave or a hut, and they eked out a meager living. And the only way they got anything was to have a knowledge of the herbs and the plants, and people came and left them food offerings for in exchange for healing. And and the, the, one of the reasons we had that crazy six and a half centuries of witch burning was the pure guilt of having these reminders of the shadow of the Catholic Church, you know, these hungry older women who were starving. They just rounded them up and called them all witches and killed them. So it's, a, it, it's one of many complicated reasons why they had the Inquisition, where they were basically trying to disempower the knowledge that had been passed down for thousands of years through the sacred feminine line and through the druid line and, and through uh, the ancient lines uh, that you know honored both the masculine and the feminine and since the catholic church was a patriarchal system where only men could be priests only men could hold power only men could make the decisions they you know they if they couldn't uh get them to join the church, then they had to kill them and get them out of the way and make up a different story, tell us a different story. And so this is how the crone got turned into that image in our subconscious of the, you know, witch with the weird nose that's got warts on her that, you know, has to be done away with. So um, this stage of life is like the grandmother. You know, would you do that to your grandmother? No. Many of us have wonderful grandmothers, grandmothers with wisdom, grandmothers who have a lifetime of experience and will have the patience to sit and listen and knew the secrets to the other side. And in this labyrinth, we're going to be talking about what this labyrinth means uh, in our next presentation and uh, the doors that lead to enlightenment in the middle. So that's all about the crone. So Kiridwan is another aspect, the mother aspect of Bridget. And the maiden mother crone, you see someone's actually done all three here in this lovely artwork with the fires of illumination and the trifold aspect of the of the um, of the moon, the candle of illumination, and here we have the three circles from the crown of Isis again. So Kiridwan is associated with the cauldron. And with magic. Now, most of us like think the cauldron. Oh my God! You know, witches. But you know what's interesting is I was listening to the Olympics last night, and the announcer said, looking at where the big flame was burning, look at that beautiful cauldron. He actually said that the flame was coming out of. I wanted to just applaud because cauldron, like crone, got turned into such a nasty word. What's the cauldron? It's a pot. It's just a big old pot that they cook stew over the fire, you know. And then, of course, you can, you know, you could make hot apple cider in it for heaven's sakes and go bobbing for apples like we do at Halloween. But most people don't, you know, the whole idea just brings up all these subconscious, you know, 700 years of people being killed for having a cauldron. So, but, um, in truth, the cauldron represents the womb. It's this dark womb where the child gestates, where new ideas gestate, where the world comes is 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 born, you know, and is from a place from which new life comes. And so 
you know, you can see this is the classic, you know, old crone in the woods stirring her magic pot with the raven and so forth. <laughs> you know, but it probably wasn't really like that, you know. Um, so I want to tell you Caridwen's tale, and I'll do a quick version of it. All of these tales can be told in a much fuller way, but it's good for you to kind of know who they are. So Caridwen's story was basically that she had a son, but he was really ugly, and she was quite concerned, like, how would he make his fortune when he went out there and he wasn't the smartest lad on the block either and so she decided she was going to make up a magic brew for a year and a day that when you took it would give him wisdom so even though he wouldn't be attractive and he might not have the muscles to go be a fighter at least he could become a stage he could become wise and so what she did was she got she hired this little boy his name was uh, Gwyden and uh, so here we have a play. Someone did a play. I thought this was fun, pretending to be her, and that would be like the sun. And here's the little boy, Gwyden. And so Gwyden had his job was to stir the brew, all stir the brew all the time. Well, shortly before the year and the day was up, uh, some of the the brew um, jump kind of you know, popped out and landed on his fingers, and he licked his fingers before he thought about it. All the wisdom of the magic brew went into his fingers. Oh, my God. Well, as soon as that happened, he became fully conscious, like spiritually aware conscious. And he realized that when Caridwen found out, she would be quite upset that the spell, you know, the potency for her son had gone to him. So he knew enough to run away. And um, sure enough, you know, when she found out, she was pretty furious. So he, there's a whole story about how he turns into a rabbit. She turns into, you know, a, a, a hawk uh, or a fox. She, he turns into a fish. She turns into a, a, an eagle. You know, in other words, she chases him through time. He becomes all these different animals. And here he's wearing the cloak of a shaman. Uh, and he was a bard. He was a, a very famous bard. And so she chases him through all these cycles of nature, which is kind of a really interesting thing when we decode this as a story. It's like us, you know, the Divine Mother chases us through our many incarnations. Maybe we started off as an amoeba somewhere. Then we became a fish. Then we became a, you know, a... Um, you know, an animal in the forest, then we became a dog or a cat, then we become a human, and so forth, and then eventually we become enlightened. And so, in this story, eventually, she, um, he turned himself into a piece of corn, little grains of corn, and she became a hen, and she ate him. <laughs> now, this is a strange story, but it's a metaphor story. That's the only way you can really get it. Guess what? She became pregnant, <laughs> and she gave birth to Talison to another boy and he became the famous bard the most famous bard in all of England he was Merlin the magician's teacher very beautiful and so uh, he he becomes the great mage the great sage the great magician the great bard uh, the great teacher to humanity in his age and this would have been just prior to the time, probably one or two generations from the time of King Arthur. So there, there are people who have, again, brought forth information on him in our time so that some of this has not been lost. But this all took place about 1,500 years ago. Um, so women have forever been linked to the moon, as we talked about. And these are also some of the symbols. We see the moon. We see the serpent. We'll talk about the serpent next time. It's nothing to be scared of, by the way. It is definitely not the Adam and Eve story that we've all been told in this patriarchal culture. We see the little bunny rabbit. We're going to learn about that uh, on our next exciting occasion, uh, on workshop number two. Um, so the moon and sun are certainly symbols, classic symbols of the yin energy of the universe and the yang energy. And these are all part of the eternal balance of life. And this is, of course, what the great mystery schools were working for. They were really working to activate all parts of ourselves, male and female, air, earth, fire, and water, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical, and to achieve mastery in our connection with our higher self and to awaken our spiritual 
um, gifts. And this can only happen with the masculine and the feminine in balance with one another. Now we see this same kind of symbolism expressed in what is clearly the moon, the moon, and while we know this is the moon, guess what, it kind of doubles as the sun, doesn't it? So again, they're kind of saying, when the masculine and feminine are balanced, then we can open that inner portal and gain access. And we see the symbol, of course, over the maiden, the mother and crone, and the three cycles of life, the child, of course, the youth, and the the wisdom of the sage, and we see the stars of Isis arrayed around her. As we know, each stage has its advantages and disadvantages. When we're young, you know, we're more in touch with nature. We're often more in touch with our feelings, our emotions. You know, we're not having to earn a living as a rule or get a job. We're not having to worry about sex. We're actually, you know, anything's possible. The world is our oyster. We can dream our dreams and, and begin to plan what we want to create in our lives. As an adult, many times we are creating what we want, but many times we're burdened with responsibilities. We're burdened with bills and, and jobs and a nine to five schedule and not enough hours of the day. We're burdened with the children that maybe we wanted to have or maybe we went and didn't, but they sure take a whole bunch of time and energy and attention. So many times we come last. We're the life giver. We're the one that holds the family together uh, along with hopefully a wonderful husband. Um, and then eventually we get to this last stage of life where the children have gone off and they've started their own lives and where maybe we're not as hot and sexy as we were as a maiden, but we we can choose what we want in our life. We can extract from the experiences we've gone through the wine or the grapes of wisdom that we can then share with other people in our lives. And so it's important to know that even though we, you know, when we're young and beautiful, what's that old saying, you know, there's a couple of them. One is, you know, um, you know, some people are like, I don't, I would never want to go back because I wouldn't want to be that young and foolish, but then I looked pretty great. And then when we're wise enough to know better, we of course have lost some of the, you know, the, elasticity of the body. So these cycles of maiden mother crone are linked with the, the natural unfolding cycles of life and of nature. They're connected to our soul evolution as we go back into the heavens between lifetimes and come back to earth or to the, or to the physical world to have these experiences. And they're linked to the past, the present, and the future. And in, in the Greek world, these were thought of as the three fates, okay? And they are, here they are spinning the thread of the, of, of your life or of your destiny on the, on the spindle, you know, um, and of course, you can also see that they they represent aspects of air and water and fire. In other words, our thought, our emotions, and our our passion or our ego for life, and how we have to balance them. Once the patriarchy took over again, they couldn't quite get rid of all these symbols because they had been around for thousands and thousands of years. So the three fates became known as the three muses. And this is, of course, a Renaissance painting depicting that triple goddess that we've come to know and to appreciate now what is behind this ancient symbolism. These three stages embody all aspects of our lives, all aspects of each and every girl or woman or maiden or grandmother out there. Unless your life is cut short, we are all going to live through all of these three phases of life with the goods and the bads, the ups and the downs, the advantages and the disadvantages in order to finally bring ourselves back into the flow of life and harmony with the universe. And this, of course, is something that the goddess path knows well. They didn't make it so that you only had one life. That's not what they taught. You know, hey, heaven and hell, one chance to get it right. No, that was not the theology. They understood that each of us is an immortal soul, that we each come many times into the physical world to have experiences, to have adventures, to undergo tests, to experience what it is to love. Uh, whether it's a man or a child or a husband or a community or principal. And, and consequently, they understood that this is a constant flow from birth 
to life, to death, to rebirth. We all go in the spiritual evolution of the ages. And this was, of course, why they buried their dead in the fetal position inside the womb of the Mother Earth. So this is, of course, the eternal journey that we all take, and it was known within the Goddess Path. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Part two, we're going to be looking at a hidden history of the Divine Mother. I think you'll really enjoy that. In part three, we're going to get into the lost symbols of the Goddess. In part four, we get into Mary Magdalene and the return of the Divine Sophia, discovering who she really was and how her incarnation had been prophesied, even as Jesus's had been. In part in part five, we're going to look for look at Mary Magdalene and the search for the Holy Grail and the mysteries of the Grail and, and the British Isles and Arthur Pendragon. And in part six, we're going to learn about the secret teachings of Jesus and the path of mastery and why the Grail was so vitally important to uh, her teachings, to Jesus' teachings, and why it must be reclaimed today with each and every one of us. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. We hope that you've, you've enjoyed uh, the process of the journey of having an initiation into the Divine Feminine. It's been my pleasure to, to teach you, and I hope to see you in part two and further. Until the next time, as we say in the Goddess Path, blessed be.